All right, everybody, welcome to the White House. How's it going? Good, all right. Uh, we're excited to have you here today for our Summer Opportunity Workshop and Champions of Change event. My name's Kyle Learman. I'm an Associate Director uh, in the Office of Public Engagement, uh, handling our outreach to young Americans. And I just want to tell you how excited I am uh, to have you all here today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to do a couple special thanks. One, uh, to our partners across the administration, the Department of Education, Department of Labor, HHS, CNCS, and so many others who have made today possible. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. And then I also just really want to thank the National Summer Learning Association, who has been our partner day in and day out over the last several months putting this event together uh, and is going to be our partner moving forward. So let's give them a round of applause as well. So with that, uh, to kick things off, I'm going to turn it over uh, to someone who has really been an advocate for young people in this building and across the administration and around the country. And on this specific project, uh, she has really made the work that we are doing possible. Uh, my boss, Senior Advisor of the President, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you, Kyle, and good morning, everyone. We are just delighted to have you here as we celebrate our Champions of Change for opportunity for this summer. And I want to tell you at the outset, the Champions of Change are our favorite events here at the White House because we have the opportunity to recognize ordinary people who are just doing extraordinary things, changing our world each and every day. So I want to begin by asking our nine Champions of Change to stand. They're from eight states around the country and let us recognize you. Up you go. Thank you. Thank you for your extraordinary service. And I also want to give a shout out to the rest of you who are here in the audience or watching at home, because obviously champions don't create themselves without an enormous amount of support. So thank you for all of you who've come here to support our champs, uh, because out, without you, they couldn't do what they're doing. I think everyone remembers their first job. I certainly remember mine. I was a clinic coordinator at the University of Chicago medical center when I was 16, and my job was to uh, check people in when they came to the doctor, make sure that all of their tests were complete, and then check them out. And at first, I didn't think it was a terribly important job, but then I began to appreciate how important everybody's role was in the healthcare delivery, working effectively and safely for our patients. And I still remember when I received my first paycheck. I think I should have framed it and saved it forever, but I probably spent it that first weekend. <laughs> And it made me feel a sense of value. And fast forward, about 30 years later, I became the chairman of the board of the Chicago, University of Chicago Medical Center. And I think it helped me enormously chair the board to have been a clinic coordinator and really seen how the organization worked from the ground up. And those early opportunities, too many of our young people do not have. And it can be the difference between a life towards the prison or a life towards the corner office. And everybody here is working to make sure that the track is, is that every young child has an opportunity to achieve their dreams. I often say that talent is ubiquitous. Opportunity is not. And it's our job to make sure we level that playing field and make sure that every young person, regardless of the zip code in which they live, has that opportunity to achieve their dreams. And um, I often tell the story of Ursula Burns, who started out as a summer intern at Xerox. And now here she is, the CEO of Xerox. And so we just want to make sure every young child has that opportunity. And who knows what they're going to want to do in life? But that job gives them a sense of self-worth. It teaches them important skills that will stay with them throughout their lives. And it can dramatically change their lives. And so that's what our champions have dedicated themselves to doing. Um, and they have worked their magic each and every day in their communities around our country in those eight states. And we want to hold them up as role models that everyone else should emulate. Uh, the president often talks about how this is his um, home stretch, his last year in office, uh, but that after that, the office he holds is one of citizen. And that's one we all hold. And part of being a citizen is accepting our responsibility to our society and to make it good. And just because we have a job doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to ensure everyone does. And that begins with your first job, it begins with a summer job. So I want to close as I open by saying thank you to the champs. 
You are our heroes. We are delighted to have you here in the White House. It was a pleasure for me to have a chance to meet each and every one of you, and I've done a lot of reading about the magic that you've worked, and we really, really appreciate it, and we thank everyone who, who was here uh, to show their support. So enjoy the day. I would mention that we have um, Acting uh, Secretary of Education, John King, who is here. We have Megan Smith, our Chief Technology Officer. We're going to have a terrific panel discussion. We, part of what my office does, what my office does is public engagement, and so we really want to have a conversation at the same time as we honor these terrific heroes. So thank you very much, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It is good to be here with all of you. Proud to be here to celebrate our Summer Opportunity Champions of Change. As Valerie talked about, the President has been committed from the outset to investing in Summer Opportunity for our young people from the earliest days of the stimulus package. We were focused on making investments that would support opportunity for jobs and summer programs. Uh, we've had a great partnership with the Agriculture Department focused on addressing food insecurity that so many of our young people face in the summer, our young people who rely on school as the place where they get their meals and then don't have that access in the summer. And we've been working together with USDA to ensure uh, that more of our young people have access to food in the summer. Uh, great work that has happened through AmeriCorps and the expansion of the AmeriCorps program. There are many organizations in the room that benefit from uh, AmeriCorps members, and those AmeriCorps members are helping to provide quality summer programming for our young people. We all know, we all understand how important summer is to students' success. Uh, as a teacher and as a principal, I saw firsthand what happens when students don't have good productive things to do in the summer. We know that it's a time that can contribute to summer learning loss and is a major factor in the achievement gap for low-income students. We also know summer is often a time where students are less safe and where violence in the community uh, becomes a part of their daily life that maybe would be less so if they were in a quality summer program during the day. Uh, it's also the time when students who are our adolescents will get off track because they don't have that, that mentorship that they might have in a quality school setting or educational program setting or job setting. On the other hand, we also see great evidence, research base, uh, a great research base that students who do have high quality summer opportunities actually do better academically, are more likely to stay in school, more likely to graduate, more likely to get good jobs. There is a long-term benefit to the investment in summer opportunities. The President has proposed in the 2017 budget a very significant investment in summer opportunities and first jobs. Uh, the President's proposed $5.5 billion in a partnership between the Department of Education and the Department of Labor focused on summer programming, summer jobs, and also our disconnected youth, our young people who have dropped out of school, who have gotten disconnected from school and work. And we have an opportunity, uh, working with Congress, we hope, to make this significant investment. We can't afford, as a country, uh, to leave any of our, our kids out of the path to opportunity. And, and summer opportunities, again, summer programming and summer jobs can be a part of the answer for our young people. We also, probably everyone in this room also understands that summer jobs often help put you on the path uh, for professional success long term. Uh, I became a teacher and principal in no small part because of experiences I had as a summer camp counselor. My, one of my uh, most significant, most important summer jobs was while I was in college running a summer day camp for students in a public housing development in Boston uh, where we actually lived uh, in the community for the summer, a group of college students, and ran a summer camp for students. And I saw firsthand uh, the difference that experience made for my students and fell in love with teaching and the experience of helping young people find their path. Uh, so we know summer jobs can be life-changing and life-transformative. Looking forward today to having some of our champions of change come up for a panel discussion where we can delve deeper into the great models that they are involved in. Uh, we had 700 nominations for champions of change, and uh, we selected uh, nine folks who are here today, five of whom are going to join us for this uh, 
for this panel. And I, I think you will hear uh, from them powerful, powerful examples. So I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Laura Huerta Migas, uh, the Executive Director of the Association of Children's Museums in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, the Association, come on up. The Association. <laughs> The association is the world's largest professional society promoting and advocating on behalf of children's museums and children's museum professionals. Uh, next, I want to invite up Lauren Riley, who is the program director of Practice Makes Perfect in New York City. As program director, Lauren has created a scalable programmatic framework to help take our nation, to help tackle our nation's summer school crisis. Next, I want to invite up Victor Francisco Lopez, founder. <laughs> Victor is the founder of Learner's Chess in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Learner's Chess uses the game as a medium through which to coach and mentor students. Over 5,300 students have participated in Learner's summer chess camps and after school chess programs. Uh, next, I want to invite up Ria Rahman. <laughs> Ria is a senior in political science at Baylor University in Texas and has increased child hunger awareness and advocacy among college students um, alongside with the Texas Hunger Initiative and Share Our Strengths No Hungry Kid campaign. Uh, she has also worked as an AmeriCorps VISTA summer associate where she promoted the summer meals program. Uh, next I want to ask Alec Lee to come up. <laughs> Alec is the co-founder and executive director of AIM High in San Francisco. AIM High is an educational nonprofit serving middle school youth in the Bay Area from under-resourced communities. For the last 30 years, AIM High has engaged students in a multi-year free summer learning program that blends academics, enrichment, and college and career preparedness. So now that everyone's on the stage, let's jump into the discussion. And let me ask each of you to describe for us what is it, maybe we'll start with you, Lauren, what is it that inspired you to get involved in issues of summer learning and summer programming? Definitely. I grew up um, in San Francisco, and I was blessed with opportunities that a lot of students didn't have. My parents were professors, and I got to have books over the summer. I got to go to camps. And I became a teacher in the Bronx and Harlem, and I recognized that my ninth and 12th graders didn't have those opportunities. And I saw every single summer the work we did all school year kind of fell flat over the summer, right? And that they didn't have those opportunities. And so joined Practice Makes Perfect and realized that there was a solution, that summer didn't have to be a time of loss. And so what we do is basically we are a summer school provider. So we know that principals don't really have those opportunities to build a summer program because they don't have the bandwidth to do it. And so we come in and we only focus on summer. And we're using a near peer mentorship model to make it work. Um. So I really had no idea that child hunger was an issue in the United States until the summer after my sophomore year of college. Um, I went on a mission trip with Baylor University and the Texas Hunger Initiative on a complete whim, and we learned about child hunger and what you know people are doing about it at a federal level, at a state level, at a local level. And I just remember coming back that summer um, to Dallas, which is where I'm from, and I was sitting in my bed and I just thought, I am sitting here right now, but what could I be doing? What did I do that really inspired me in DC and why can't I be doing it here in my own home, in my own community? Um, so I reached out to the Texas Hunger Initiative's Dallas office and they were so kind enough to offer me my first summer internship. And once I got involved with the summer meals program and saw the kids I was helping in my own community, I was hooked and that's where it all started. Great, thank you. Victor? Uh, yeah, so for me, uh, I provide summer opportunities for kids to learn chess, and uh, chess was a game that I learned when I was in sixth grade, and it immediately resulted in me getting better grades in school and being more engaged with my schoolwork and feeling more confident about how smart of a person I was. Uh, and so my mom helped me start a after-school chess program the following year, and I was a chess coach from seventh grade through twelfth grade, 
And um, kind of after college, I was community organizing and substitute teaching, and I needed a summer job myself. And so I started a summer chess camp for kids. And then that's where kind of things really clicked for me. And I realized that I was really making a difference in a lot of kids' lives because chess really does like meet a niche that isn't filled by um, by sports or by art or, or things like that that aren't quite engaging for kids. Uh, chess is a perfect interdisciplinary opportunity for them to learn. And so I've been getting a lot of feedback from parents that chess has really changed their lives. And that's how I got my program started. Well, I'm here because I'm inspired by the community that I represent, um, the children's museums around the world, and uh, really was involved with them because I had such a rich experience um, with informal learning organizations in my life. You know, we really believe that learning happens um, all life long, on all day long. And um, summer was just such a rich time for me growing up of not only museum visits, but also library visits. And um, as we look at our network of organizations, we know that uh, I'm sure many of you in the audience are thinking about the museums you're going to go to this summer. Um, and it's our time of highest visitation. And I think that tells us something about the need and the role that museums and children's museums in particular can play. And, I'm just constantly inspired by the amount of outreach. It's not just about going to the museum, but the amount of work that our organizations do in their community to take play and learning and their expertise and out to their community, partnering with wonderful programs, um, summer programs, partnering with schools, partnering with community-based organizations and churches um, to really provide a rich, and stable network of experience for children. And um, especially during the summer, and especially for our youngest students. That's really where our heart is, um, that we're building that foundation from age zero. And um, we're just really, you know, I'm really proud to be able to represent the wonderful work that our, um, our network does uh, across the country and around the world. Thank you. Well, I also had rich and joyful summer learning opportunities as a youth. I, I went to Camp Minnewanka in Stony Lake, Michigan, and it was fantastic. But after graduating from college, I spent four summers working at Horizons Upward Bound in Detroit, Michigan. And that's where I really saw just how powerful a multi-year college readiness uh, summer opportunity can be. And most of you know Upward Bound is for high school students. So moved to San Francisco, and a friend and teaching colleague and I came up with the idea for Aim High. And, and we love the name, and we love the model. And we decided to focus on middle school students and make a multi-year commitment uh, to kids, four years, grades six through nine, uh, during the summer. And really try to intersect um, academic rigor um, but also opportunity and joy. That's really what summer is about. Uh, so we're celebrating our 30th anniversary uh, this summer uh, with 17 programs um, across uh, the Bay Area. We couldn't be more proud to, to represent our, our kids and families and teachers here today. Thank you. Thank you all. Let me ask you to share maybe what, what you see as some of the ways that you've effectively partnered across sectors. So how have you engaged government? How have you engaged philanthropy in the work that, you, that you're doing? I can kick it off. Um, we are really big on summer jobs. And I think this is something where we're not leveraging the communities we're working with as a society. There are kind of success stories in every pocket of America. And if we can bring those into summer, we're seeing success. And what PMP has done really well with summer jobs is finding those high achieving mentors who are only four years older than our kids that are in our program. If we're in a kindergarten class, the kids I'm hiring are fourth grade success stories from the same neighborhood. If I'm in a seventh grade class, my, my high achieving mentors are in 11th grade, but they go to the same bodega after school to grab a snack. And so by showing that we can connect really great success stories and show our scholars what success looks like, they are already seeing that path to success. They can't always look to their teacher as a role model because we're too big in age, right? If I was teaching seventh grade, I'm too old. They're not gonna see my path, but they are gonna see the eighth grader who is getting A's on their exams. And we're giving them jobs over the summer so they can continue 
to push themselves and really be college ready, and our scholars are now seeing what college ready looks like. Um, so I'm so lucky to get to work at the Texas Hunger Initiative, and we're a statewide organization, but we have 12 regional um, offices throughout the state, and they really try to strive for public and private partnerships and really utilizing the community members and making sure that there's local autonomy and working with the people in the community to better the people in the community while working on a statewide level and just advocating for them and being a voice for them and um, we work with everyone so in Dallas we worked with United Way we worked with multiple other organizations for every summer meal opportunity that we had and it was a really great experience to see people coming together to just really love the pe people that they live with the, their neighbors their classmates and everything like that and so being a student it was great to see that in my own community and get to share in part with that. Uh, yeah, so for our program, um, a lot of the challenge is getting the word out and kind of making chess a cool thing for kids to try in a summer program. Um, so partnering with businesses just to put our flyers in their, you know, in their place of business in their storefront really helps out. But we also work with a nonprofit, um, actually it's United Way, and they have a program called Mission Graduate, where they're trying to graduate 20,000 new, um, like new graduates by the year 2020. And part of that is a Launch to Learn program, which uh, encourages kids to get out and take advantage of summer opportunities. And so they have like a summer learning passport. They, they, you can get stamps um, for going to chess camp or going to the library or doing some like even do-it-yourself type of learning opportunities at home. And they also have like a list of places where you can go get like uh, your immunizations and things like that. So a lot of things that parents need to do over the summer they can get those stamped and then at the end of the summer they have a big party and a lot of local businesses contribute for prizes and things like that. And so I think that's one strategy like beyond my program that is really good for keeping kids engaged throughout the summer. In our community, we see um, these relationships at a number of levels, at the community level, um, which I would say at the museum level, where they're leveraging local relationships, um, particularly to uh, create opportunity. Nearly 100% of our children's museums um, have dedicated relationships around access. We know access is such an issue, so um, working with their Title I schools to provide free or reduced membership all year round, um, or access free, excuse me, access to summer camp programs, etc. Um, we also see some of these relationships at the regional level, and at the national level, um, one of the programs that um, we are leveraging because of this wonderful uh, commitment that children's museums have to access and to equity is in partnership with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, our federal agency, um, for the Museums for All initiative that provides free to $3 admission for uh, anybody who shows an EBT card. So this is particularly um, serving uh, folks that are receiving food assistance and other benefits. So we're really looking to leverage existing channels and programs to provide access to, I think, an experience and opportunity that we think is very rich that folks may not be looking for. Um, we really believe in the ecology of services and that we're a critical node in that. We need to m make um, folks aware and give them access to things maybe they aren't aware they can get access to. Our closest partners are, are schools and principals, districts. Um, 15, 20 years ago, as some of you may know, the California state budget was just crushed and summer was essentially eliminated. Um, it's slowly coming back, actually thanks to the work of National Summer Learning Association. Um, but we fill a niche uh, serving about 2,000 kids and um, we're only effective if we're adding value uh, to schools um, and, and, and helping increase proficiency, but also I think principals and counselors and teachers look to us because we're creating problem solvers and critical thinkers and, and lifelong learners like my, my colleagues up here. I was struck by your question though about partnering with philanthropy. I, I imagine we all, that's a, a challenge and opportunity, right? Um, but um, the, the whole field of summer learning and the impact of summer learning as a critical lever 
in addressing both the achievement gap and opportunity gap, I mean, that has started to resonate uh, with um, city governments um, and with foundations. And so we've had some success, um, obviously, um, raising the, the funding required to, to grow. And, and I hope that's true for the other organizations up here, too, but certainly a challenge. Thanks. So we've got some local elected officials in the room, folks who are, who are leaders in their local communities. If a local community wanted to make sure that every child from K through 12 was in a high quality program or in a great job, what are some of the obstacles that you think or challenges that they'll, they'll need to overcome? And then your thoughts on how, how they might overcome those. And, and anyone can answer. We don't have to go down the line, but yeah, yeah, please. So um, I think specifically from the, the place that we're sitting and the families that we know we hear from, it's um, there's both too much information and not enough uh, at the same time. So uh, I think there was an after school alliance survey that was done about after school opportunities and particularly looking at uh, low income and underserved parents who had a high awareness of the need and importance of high quality after school and summer opportunity um, programs for their children and their success and a very low awareness of how to get to those programs. Um, so I think in terms of how we overcome those barriers, again, something that we're uh, really working on leveraging is not reinventing communication wheels, but identifying and opening up those channels and those programs, especially those that are run um, from at the governmental level, whether they be city, state, regional, national, um, and opening those up to your community partners to provide access so that we're not working on creating new access points for folks that are already very overwhelmed. I think the other piece is allocating money in city budgets in state budgets as well as at even the school level. Right now, I know in New York City, the budget for summer education is very small. And I think a little bit is because we failed, right? Summer school in the past has a 60% attendance rate. You're not seeing the outcomes. So why would you allocate money there? But if we hold our summer partners accountable for real results, right, where students are showing up, where they are not just eliminating that summer learning loss, but they're also making gains, that's the program that I can put money behind. And so I think we've kind of combated that a little at Practice Makes Perfect by being a fee-for-service model and not relying strictly on philanthropy because this isn't a problem that's gonna be solved philanthropically. Right? Year after year, kids are gonna continue to lose and we need to put money behind it where programs that are actually driving results. And that's kind of what PMP has been doing in New York City, and we're looking to expand because we have the program and we have the results. Um, for us, we're also a fee-for-service program, um, but we have a need-based scholarship program. And so, like, with kids who are in our after-school programs, we really want them to come to summer camp and build on what they've learned during the school year. And in our low-income programs that we run at no cost, it's hard to convince the parents of kids who are in that program to come to the summer camp because they don't have transportation. So I think one thing that you know local governments and school districts could do is think about how they can allocate their resources to keep the, um, the buses going throughout the summer to take kids to summer camp or to the museums or things like that because I think transportation with parents who work two jobs or maybe don't even have transportation is something that's very critical. I think there are a couple of challenges. Um, I really appreciate what you said about funding and allocation. I also think creating flexibility in terms of funding um, so that districts and cities can use that funding for summer. Um, I think uh, at least in the Bay Area in California, principals and districts feel compelled to use every dollar um, during the academic year. And by the way, I get that. Um, but flexibility, I think another piece, um, is quality and what does quality look like and fortunately there are there are great tools and models and again the national summer learning association has developed to become really uh, raise the bar in terms of quality um, so again kind of here's what quality looks like um, there's um, great models and tools for for looking at that 
So those are a couple of challenges, and again, challenges are always opportunities. And as you said in your introductory remarks, summer is just so critical in so many ways. So uh, I, I, let's make it happen. Let me build out maybe on that quality point. I'd be curious for each of you, what, what would you say if you were speaking, we have uh, philanthropy represented in the room, and you know, lots of folks are coming and asking for resources. How would you evaluate quality? What are the things that drive you when you think about what a great summer experience is going to look like for a young person? Um, so about quality, um, after my first summer at, in Dallas, uh, I really saw the Summer Food Service Program. I saw the number of sites in Dallas. I saw the number of sponsors. And all I could think was, you know, there are some really great sponsors doing really exceptional work, but how can we highlight them and encourage other sponsors to incorporate best practices? How can we make them better and make sure that all of these kids are um, getting the best meals that they need? Um, and so this summer, the Dallas office at THI, um, we actually highlighted a program called the Summer, um, the Excellence in Summer Meals campaign, and I was really honored to get to do evaluations, and it was an objective um, evaluation, and sponsors were able to opt in, so it's their own accountability that they're choosing to decide to, I want to be evaluated, I want to know what I can do better, I want to know um, what more I could do, but then recognizing them for doing really great work, and in the process, we encourage other sponsors to join in that. And so there is quality and highlighting quality and making sure that other people want to, you know, come up to part of that and rec or recognizing the people that do. I think that's really essential to the process. I think a lot of quality ends up being about making sure that summer learning is fun and summer is cool and it's okay to want to do a math class and make it inquiry based and develop this love of learning. And it's not, let me tough out the math class in the morning for summer school so I can do the arts and crafts and the sports in the afternoon. There is a way to do a math class where it's going to be fun and it's going to be innovative. And it's teaching our summer teachers how to flip summer school stigma on its head. And right, how do we make it a really cool class? And a little of that is bringing dynamic teachers into the classroom. How are we training our teachers for summer education to make sure kids are developing that intrinsic motivation for learning? And I think when we're talking about a quality program, it means kids are showing up, right? Attendance is high. Yes, you're gonna have to do the testing piece so we can prove we're eliminating that loss. Let's make sure that kids are consistently being even a small exit ticket, just figuring out is what you're doing day after day working and making sure that we are driving student outcomes. Alec? I love what you said and completely agree. Um, Summer is an opportunity to be different. Our program team, I mean, I think they wake up every morning saying, how can we be different? And that doesn't mean not rigorous and not challenging and not linked to standards. But we make sure that uh, every kid after three or four years at AIM High, they have, they have built a terrarium, they've done a catapult, they've done an oral history and interviewed members of their neighborhood and their family. And those are really their AIM High exit tickets. In addition, they've spent time on college campuses. So again, it, it's that kind of intersection of rigor and challenge, but also fun and opportunity. And to me, that's what summer quality looks like. Um, I think I'd like to um, offer just some thoughts. And the approach in our community is really thinking about the whole child. And I would like to invite folks to think beyond academic outcomes, which of course are critical, but academic outcomes are dependent on so many other things in a child's life. So I'd like for us to think about what's developmentally appropriate, what is environmentally uh, required for a child's success. Um, that may be academic support, but it may be more important to provide social emotional support life skill support. Um, even at the youngest ages, it might be more important to provide family support. So when we're looking at quality and quality programs, do our program leads know the children that they are serving? Um, and the other thing I think I'd like to put out there is that it's easy for us to fall into this idea of um, fixing children. And our children are, don't need to be fixed over the summer. Um, our children are perfect the way they are. 
Um, and we need to help them move through some systems that are challenging for them and environments that might be broken. Um, and I think that that's another indicator of quality. How are we lift, what's the plan? What are the outcomes for lifting our children up? All of them. Um, one quick thing I have to add to uh, quality is just hiring, like for me, I'm hiring chess coaches all the time and I want to hire coaches who are passionate about both working with kids and also about the game of chess. And usually the best pool that I have to recruit from are the former participants in my program. So we have a junior leadership program where we're developing kids to have leadership skills and learn how to manage a group of kids and teach them chess and then like the idea is that eventually they'll go on and be paid chess coaches. Our program's still kind of young, so we're not quite there yet, but, uh, but I, I think tapping a, a resource pool of the kids who've already participated in your program is a really w great way to get passionate people who can make it a high quality program. I'm gonna get this right eventually. <laughs> I wanted to add just one comment about the quality, and I'm not sure if you agree, but that kind of quality, and, and it's the aim high story too, is sometimes harder to measure. And so you asked about challenge and making the case, and again, that's probably what we all do every day, right, is make the case uh, for investing in our work. But that kind of quality is a little harder to measure, and so that's, a, I think, a challenge we probably all face, but, um, but I think we're also committed to tackling and, and we're, faithful to the kind of um, program model that, that we've developed. Really quickly, just wanted to add, because I think Laura brings up a really great point about social emotional learning, as well as getting the whole family involved. So many times we think about summer learning, and it's just about the child. Well, I think we do ourselves a disservice there, right? Let's get the whole family involved in summer learning. Right? Let's see what's happening during the day, whether they're going to a museum, they're playing chess. Let's get the family excited about that. And then it's not just the organizations we work with inspiring the kid, but it's the organization inspiring the whole family. And that's how systemic change is built. So we don't have that much time left, but I have two, two last questions. I'm wondering if at least a couple of you could share something that you improved about your program or even a mistake that you made where you, you started to do something and you realized it wasn't working and you shifted strategy. So I think sometimes in these conversations when we bring up uh, folks who are doing great work like all of you, it seems like a straight path with no bumps, but there are always bumps. So it'd be helpful <laughs> to hear a couple of places where, where you feel like your program or your efforts have grown or improved. We make mistakes all the time. Um, no, I think the big piece when we first started, Practice Makes Perfect is five years old. Um, my CEO founded the organization at the ripe old age of 18. So we've, we've been around for just, like, just over five years. And the near peer mentorship part of our organization is the, my favorite part, it's the biggest part. Kids show up because there's a role model that looks like them. And I think the piece we thought, we thought that was enough. Right? As long as I have my kindergarten class and I'm hiring my fourth grade mentors, everything will be fine. I'll put a lead teacher in the front of the classroom and that model works. Well, if you don't tell a fourth grader what the summer learning loss is, how to be a mentor, it's just a, you know, an additional five kids in your classroom. So the piece that we've kind of had to overhaul is that near peer mentorship training. I have a staff that works with all of our near peer mentors during the school year so that by the time summer rolls around, we can hit the ground running. That training piece and training not just your near peer mentors, but I'm sure your teachers, your museum staff, whatever the case is, preparing them for what mentorship looks like for a summer program has been huge for us. <laughs> I can speak to that actually. <laughs> um, when we first started out, we were really focused on like chess. If kids get good at chess, they'll be good in school. And so we would really focus on making sure that kids were really excellent chess players. Um, and we found that what we were doing was burning kids out of some, some of our kids were getting kind of burned out of chess. So we expanded what we do and now we have chess puzzles and like lots of different chess related activities that still engage with the mechanics of the game that can, um, that can, that can turn kids on to the game of chess and make them more engaged with the program. So we've, we've kind of actually pulled back from the requirements of trying to make kids better or higher rated at chess and, and let them find their own path to it. Go ahead. I'll be brief. 
I think our, our big step forward recently was um, becoming super focused on, on data and using data to, ri to, to drive improvement across our 17 programs and really creating that organizational learning culture where our site directors, they, they can't wait to look at the data from the summer and start setting goals and planning for how to make the next year and the next summer better and how to serve kids even more effectively. So that was an important step for us. Thank you all. So we, we, I think we have a minute left, maybe. <laughs> so if you could each in uh, 15 seconds or so uh, give folks in the room a call to action. What, what, what would you encourage them to try to accomplish if our goal is making uh, summer 16 best summer of opportunity ever for kids in America? What's, what's the call to action for them? Put money behind it. I think summer, right, summer is not a time we have to give up on. We know that there are great organizations out there who are doing really amazing work. Let's put the dollars behind it to make sure that every kid has access to a great summer program. Um, looking around, I feel like I might be the only student here, but I know that there are so many other students just around the nation looking for a cause, looking for a voice, and I think we have a role in that. And so if you can work in your communities and encourage your students, encourage your millennials to do something about it, to take up a cause and be a voice for people who need a voice. Um, you know, children are such a vulnerable population, and I found so much value in myself and just lending my voice to them. And so encourage other people my age, encourage younger people who are not quite children, but you know, in that, weird age, I guess. <laughs> um, just encouraging them to have a part in it, you know, show their stake in this issue. Uh, yeah, it's hard for me to say that you guys should do any one thing, because I know you guys all come from different uh, backgrounds and industries, but I think one thing is just giving people some time to be summer mentors. I know that uh, there's lots of people who have passions that they can't make their careers like I have with chess, but if you, if you're into pottery or something, maybe, or if you have an employee who's into pottery, they can take a week off and run their own summer program because it's something that they're passionate about. They can be an influencer over a child, you know, beyond just the teacher, but they can help, help mentor a child and ignite passions for kids throughout the summer. Um, I'd like to offer this idea of holding hands. So I want to make sure that as you as individuals are thinking about what you're going to do in the summer. You know somebody whose hand you're going to be holding in partnership um, to move forward. And if you are a funder <laughs> or uh, an official who is funding and supporting programs, making sure that you're, um, the folks that you are supporting are holding each other's hands because we're a system, we're a network, we're a fabric. Summer is one part of the year, and the year is a year long. Um, so that's what I'd like to leave people with. One of the blessings of being the co-founder, uh, I'm still in touch with our original students. And one of those students um, from 1987 was with AIM High for three years, came back to teach in the program. And the way she describes it, when I, she says, when I walked through the door that very first day, I had no idea how many doors were opening up for me. And so my call to action is that summer really matters. And uh, so thank you for hosting a day devoted to summer and dig into the research and the models uh, because we can make this happen for millions more kids. Please thank me in joining our, and uh, congratulating our uh, fantastic panel. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be in a room of people who are all committed to expanding opportunity for our kids this summer. And it's important that we, we remind ourselves what is at stake for each of our children, right? This could be the summer that helps a student gain the academic skills, the socio-emotional skills, the life experiences that set them on the right path. Or this could be the summer that we lose a child. Um, you know, I was, I was in Miami last week. We, we were announcing a part of My Brother's Keeper that's focused on reducing chronic absenteeism. And Congresswoman Wilson gave a powerful speech and event on Friday as the community committed to My Brother's Keeper about the risk of losing our children and the number of funerals that she has gone to. Uh, 
And everyone in the room committed that we're going to do better. We're going to do better as a community. We're going to do better as a country. And then on Saturday in Miami, a six-year-old was killed. And it just, it, it, it brought to me such clarity about the urgency of this work, the urgency of making sure that every one of our kids has a safe, productive place to be this summer, uh, not sometime long in the future, this summer. And we can all make a difference in that. So thank you all for being here and part of this conversation. Thank you.